So you've decided to get a 3D printer. You've got it set up, and you've downloaded a whole bunch of great historical wargaming STL files that you can't wait to print out, paint up, and get out on your tabletop. But maybe you're sitting in your slicer wondering just what are all these settings? Well, that's what I'm going to talk about today. Greetings, Little Warriors. This is Little Wars TV. I'm Steve, and this is part four in my introductory series to 3D printing for the historical wargamer. Now, today we're going to be getting a little technical, but don't let that scare you off, because really the purpose of this episode is to take some very common 3D printing terms that may sound rather exotic and demystify them so you understand exactly how they affect 3D printing and how they can affect your prints. Now please realize, I cannot in this one video, or even probably in a dozen videos, go over in any detail all the different settings that you can set up in your slicer. So I'm going to focus on only the most common and most important ones. And I'm not going to be able to tell you exactly what settings to use in your slicer, because it's going to differ from printer to printer, from filament to filament, and it can even be affected by the environmental conditions in your homes. So really this is about telling you what these settings mean and allowing you to then experiment with these settings in your own environment and find out what setting works best for you. Now I mentioned before that you do have the option of going out there and downloading profiles that other users have put together which put all your settings in place for you. Two reasons why, while that's a great practice, you may still want to learn about individual settings as well. One, those profiles may not be perfect for your printer, your filament, and your environmental conditions. Second, if things go wrong, it helps if you have at least a basic grasp of some of the basic settings so that you can tweak those yourself before you need to run online or try and get help elsewhere. Learn these settings, learn what they mean, learn how to tweak them, and you will get great results. Lastly, please remember that everything I'm going to talk about today has to do with FDM printers. I don't own a resin printer. I've never used a resin printer, so nothing I have to say here is built on any experience dealing with resin printers whatsoever. So with that out of the way, let's get rolling. The first two settings I want to talk to you about are probably the easiest to grasp. They're speed and temperature. Speed is pretty much exactly what it sounds like, just how fast your printer prints. Now, there are so many printers out there, I again can't tell you exactly what speed is ideal for you to print at, so I just really want to tell you one important rule that I always follow. Remember what I've said before, the key to a print success is first layer adhesion, and you can actually use speed to help with that. Even if your printer is normally printing at 100%, take that first layer and tell your printer to only print it at 50% speed or 40% speed. By taking that extra time to be extra careful about building that first layer, you're going to increase the chances of getting a great successful print. Next up is temperature. And there's two temperature settings that you should be familiar with from the get-go. One is the nozzle temperature, and the second is, if you have a heated bed on your printer, and, and most of them do now, the bed temperature. Now what you set these at is going to depend on two different things. First, the kind of plastic that you're using. PLA, for example, tends to print with lower temperatures than PETG, for example. And those are just two different types of plastics if you're not familiar with what I'm throwing around here. So figure out what kind of plastic that you have. And then also, with every different filament that you get, the manufacturers should give you a general range where they believe that their plastic is going to print most successfully. Something that can be useful when you're trying to find out the right temperature to use for a particular kind of filament is a temperature calibration file, like this one. Uh, this is a G-code that you plug into your printer, tell it to print, and it prints different parts of the file at different temperatures so that later on you can look at it and say, huh, eh, I thought that this printed best at 195 degrees, for example. Then, once you've gotten this figured out, you really should write it down. Uh, you may end up using different filament types over time, or just forget what your usual filament prints best at. Write it down in a notebook you keep next to the printer and you'll never have to worry about it. The next somewhat obvious term is layer height. 
Most FDM printers these days can go down to layers that are as thin as 0.05 millimeters or 50 microns up to about 0.25 millimeters per layer or 250 microns. Now the thing to understand with layer height is the higher your layer height or the thicker your layers are, the faster your printer is going to be able to print a particular file. That being said, the thicker the layer height, it also is going to show up more when you look at it. So the layering effect is going to be more obvious. Now, you might think that for the most detail and the highest definition, you want to go with layer heights that are as small as possible, that, that 50 micron level. I found that's not always true though, and actually I get my best results on my Prusa anyway by printing at about 100 microns or 0.1 millimeters. I've seen various explanations for why this is that really aren't important now, but what you'll want to do is just experiment maybe with the same print at different layer heights and see what you think looks best for you. All right, now those terms were the easiest ones to understand, so let's bump up the degree of difficulty a little bit. I've mentioned it many times before in previous videos, and I've already mentioned it once or twice in this video, but I'm going to do it again here. The key to a successful print is first layer adhesion. You want that first layer to be stuck to your build plate like glue. Uh, until you want to take it off anyway, but for the printing itself, you want that nice and solid. You want a good bond. And there are a number of different tools that you can use. One is uh, this, a setting called a brim. What a brim is, is a single layer of printing that extends from half a centimeter to a centimeter around the perimeter of the print and is attached to it. And what this does is as the, the nozzle moves up and the print has been sitting on the print bed for a longer period of time, there will be some cooling that goes on and that sometimes can cause corners of prints to curl up. Well, if that happens on a print that has a brim, it's the corner of the brim, which you're going to trim away anyway that might curl up a little bit, and not the print itself. Uh, I learned very early on when I was printing to pretty much always use some sort or some size of brim. Now, when you pull the print off the bed with a brim, of course, it's going to look terrible, but just get a hobby knife and you trim it off just like you would flash from any other sort of plastic model. Next up, we have infill or infill percentage. Infill is simply the percentage of the interior hollow space in a model that is filled with plastic. The bottom line is most 3D prints do not need to be 100% solid plastic, and certainly in the wargaming context they don't need to be. We're not putting these things under tremendous stress. In most cases they're just sitting on a tabletop looking pretty. So I found, personally, that infill percentages of only 10, 15, or at most 20% are perfectly fine. The only time I'll generally go higher or change up my usual infill percentage is if the designer of a particular STL file advises that you use a specific infill. Then I'll always listen. But what it ends up looking like is a lattice work or crisscross pattern of structures inside the actual print itself, which serves two purposes. It does give it some structural strength and also gives a base upon which the print, when it gets to the top level, can, uh, can go in between walls over a hollow space. Next up is supports. Now to understand why the support concept is important, you have to remember how FDM printers build their prints. They start from the bottom up, building each layer on top of the layer that came before it. Well, that becomes a problem if there's a dramatic overhang or if suddenly a layer needs to be built way out over midair where there weren't layers below it. That's where supports come in. Let me give you an example. This T-34 turret. As you can see here, a big portion of the turret and the entire gun really end up being printed over top of thin air instead of a layer that went before it. Well, we have it here in the slicer, and that's where your supports are added. The slicer will detect where supports are needed and creates code for your printer to build what is, in effect, plastic scaffolding under your print's various overhangs. Here's what that T-34 turret looks like after the slicer has added supports. And here's what that T-34 turret looks like after it's been printed up. I admit, it looks a little bit messy, but those supports are easy to remove with a needle nose pliers. Of course, even as easy to remove as supports can be, it does take time. That's why I absolutely love it when an STL designer has in their description no supports necessary. Now to test just how much of an overhang your printer can print with no problem and no need of supports, there are calibration files that you can download off of the internet 
kind of like that temperature gauge that I showed you earlier, specifically designed to test overhangs. This is one, and I'll put the description down below. Using this, I've obviously been able to figure out that my printers can print with overhangs up to 60, even 65 degrees. Now, if you do need to add supports, there tend to be two options you can choose from in most slicers. One is supports from build plate only. That's what it sounds like. The supports that are built are only built if they reach all the way from the build plate up to whatever it is that it's supporting on the model. That's going to work for a vast majority of your prints. Sometimes, though, if you have an interesting print where within the print itself there's a large overhang, that it's not overhanging the build plate, but it's overhanging other parts of the miniature, then you would use full supports. That puts supports in between those different surfaces of your miniature itself. That can lead to good results, but it can sometimes place supports in areas that are very difficult to reach and difficult to remove. Finally, let me talk to you about retraction, which is perhaps the most complex of the concepts that we're going to talk about here. And before I tell you exactly what retraction does, let me tell you what problem it's meant to solve. Remember that what we're dealing with here is a printer that is melting plastic into a liquid and then pushing that liquid plastic out through a nozzle. And that nozzle doesn't have a hatch or a door or anything like that on it. So when that nozzle's traveling through space between two different areas where it wants to print, some of that plastic is going to leak out because of the pressure coming down from above. That creates stringing. Stringing uh, very often isn't a problem. You can just pull it off by hand or snip it off or melt it away with a heat gun. But it's a lot easier if you just get your retraction settings set up right the first time and then you don't have stringing much, if at all. What retraction settings do is tell your printer that when that nozzle is about to travel over open space, to pull the filament back slightly, which relieves the pressure in the nozzle, and therefore doesn't push out as much of that plastic while the nozzle is traveling through that open space. To demonstrate, let me show you the same file printed two different times. It's just two columns separated by a gap, and it's designed specifically to test your stringing. I printed the first file with no retraction whatsoever, and it's a horror show of stringing. There are even, you know, sizable chunks of plastic in there. Next is the exact same file, this time with retraction on, and the settings I find work best for my printer, filament, and printing temperature. A dramatic difference, don't you think? I don't even know if you can see the very, very thin strands that are on here, but there's only a few of them. I think that's probably enough for today. But if you master these handful of settings and get them dialed in for your printer, your filament, and your home printing environment, you're going to be well over 90% of your way to getting great prints. I hope that you found this episode helpful, and honestly, I hope that you found this entire four-part series helpful. We're about ready to start Season 2 of Little Wars TV, and I've got to start paying more attention to getting all of that produced, so no more of these regular 3D printing series episodes. That being said, I'm not going to abandon you completely. Uh, periodically, I will be posting maybe the latest things that I'm working on, or great websites that I've found, or if there's a particularly good historical miniatures wargaming Kickstarter that's popped up, I hope to do future videos on that. They'll just be a lot less regular, and uh, I make no promises as to exactly when they're going to be. Thanks, and as always, if you have any questions, comments, leave them down below, and be sure to hit the subscribe button if you haven't already to see more great Little Wars TV content. Thanks.